pleasant day to everyone and welcome to a special edition of Market Sense. I'm Patty Sindego, one of the seasoned investment analysts of VDO, and joining me today is the Chief Investment Officer of the country's largest bank, Prince Ocampo. Today, we will answer all the questions that you sent during our episode entitled, Gearing Up for a Recovery. Hello, Fritz. How are you? Hi, Patty. Good. Thank you that you, you were able to accommodate this, this special session uh, for our client. Um, we had an overwhelming response and uh, there were just too many questions to fit in uh, one episode. So we're creating this, this special episode just for them. Right. We truly appreciate all the questions that came in and uh, we felt that uh, it, it deserves uh, a special epi episode by itself. So are you ready? Yep. Shall, I, shall I start shooting questions? Go ahead. Okay. So first question. As companies streamline due to COVID, there are many employees who are forced to retire this year. How should they manage their retirement package uh, in order to preserve their capital and also make um, income from those investments? That's a very good question, Patty, and, and, and it's true. Um, many people who didn't plan to retire suddenly uh, were given the notice slip and um, they have a, a lot of cash on their hands. So my first uh, advice would be to, to, uh, to analyze uh, opportunities that come their way. And in the meantime, maybe uh, they can park their cash in um, a safe instrument like a money market fund so that they're not pressured uh, to make hasty decisions. Okay. Second is uh, part of the, uh, the fund um, should go in um, low risk assets uh, that would uh, result in regular coupon payments um, like, like bonds. Bond? Um, so they can take risk with part of the fund and they can put the rest of their fund in low risk instruments. That way, um, they would be able to diversify their portfolio and still assure themselves that they can get uh, regular coupon payments or cash flows down the road. So if I may just summarize what you said, uh, you can put some in cash for now, but the others you can already um, invest in, in instruments such as bonds. Yes, uh, just focus on short term, um, uh, relatively short bonds, let's say uh, one and a half uh, to five year bonds. Um, because as we've been saying, uh, we're headed for low interest rates for longer. Um, and, and so by the time those uh, bonds mature, then uh, yields would start moving up and they can reinvest again uh, down the road. Okay. Next question, Fritz. Uh, and this is talking about the recovery that uh, was basically the focus of our discussion uh, during that episode. What industry or sectors are expected to lead the economic recovery? But I believe you've answered that, so maybe you could just refresh us for a bit. Okay. Um, so when when you look at the uh, the the badly hit sectors, uh, this would be in the uh, tourism. Uh, sectors. So the subsectors would be airlines, hotels, restaurants, and in the service sector, this would be the restaurants. Um, on the stock market, this would be the cyclical uh, sectors, the uh, banks and property. So as we uh, gear up for a recovery in 2021, um, watch or evaluate these companies that were badly uh, sold down in the market and um, you may want to slowly start picking up so that when the recovery takes place or when the uh, economic reforms are passed um, and these companies start to move up you would have already positioned Fritz, there's a follow-up question for that would you be able to give your stock picks for those sectors. <laughs> okay, uh, in terms of stock picks until year end, I, I'd assume that um, the market 
right, sorry. the market would remain uh, on a defensive sector sector so telco and retailers uh, and utilities would still be the focus uh, but gearing up for the recovery next year um, then you may want to start picking up on on banks that have been uh, ba badly sold down um, we believe that the fist law will be very positive it will allow the banks to uh, move the non-performing loans out of the books and this would allow the banks to resume lending once again so that's one uh, and uh, all of them have been uh, sold down uh, so there there's uh, trading at uh, discounted levels uh, second would be property so while property uh, continues to experience uh, a lot of headwinds uh, there are some property names that are less vulnerable let's say from the pogo industry um, so ayala land uh, would come into play here um, uh, and then you would want to begin to look at uh, service sector like ports ictsi and uh, URC uh, would also be the, the proper place on our recovery. Now, another client is asking if you mentioned that those are the sectors that would lead an economic recovery, what about those that would probably lag or will be the last ones to recover? Mm, most likely, uh, utilities would be the last to recover because we would have to see uh, an uptick in the demand for power in both the industrial sector as well as on the residential sectors um, and um, they don't fall into uh, a recovery play right now you mentioned telco stocks correct just a few moments ago now there's a question here that's asking is it still good to to buy telco stocks well, globally, the focus uh, has been on technology, uh, digitalization, um, and and the uh, new economy. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, we don't have any place uh, that could ride on these themes. Yeah. And the only uh, sector really that you could look at would be the telco sector. Uh, the increased demand for uh, data and broadband uh falls into this category and and therefore uh pldt and globe uh could still continue to run up while they have been the uh the okay. leaders the best yeah. performers in the year 2020 if you look at the last five years uh this sector has really uh been out of favor uh and, and therefore with increased demand for broadband the new driver of growth Mm -hmm. um, these stocks can continue to do well moving forward. Next question, Fritz. Uh, there's a client saying that I, they have, or he or she has a 10 year horizon for equity investments. How much or what percent should they allocate on local equities versus global equities? So I think it's a matter of how much to invest in local stocks and how much in offshore? That, that's an excellent question, Patty. Uh, so number one is the time frame. The time horizon is correct. Uh, looking at the 10 year time, time horizon, so all the way to the year 2030, um, this would really be a good uh, window to accumulate stocks. Um, I can't give the exact precise number simply mm -hmm. because i don't know the age and objectives of the investor but at this point i would like to uh push uh both global and local equities um when you look at local equity performance it has already lagged behind not only year to date still down 24 percent um but even during the last three and five years and the reason for that could be number one that uh, the weight of the philippines in uh, global indices uh, has gone down to uh, one percent or sub one percent now uh, one and then number two as i mentioned earlier the the global themes that are relevant right now 
are are absent in our market. So technology, digitalization, um, the new economy plays are are not present in the Philippine market. We're still an, an old style brick and mortar market, and, and because of the re that reason uh, or those reasons, uh, I I would really advise to look at both global and local equities. The exact uh, distribution uh, yes. would be up to the investor. Uh, depending on your objectives and and and, uh, and uh, age, um, so it's not just the the investment horizon, the time horizon, but also you again, as what you said, consider your age and what you're 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 uh, setting these aside for. Yes, exactly, Patty. Fritz, next question for you would be, which would be better to invest in in terms of a fund? Is it an equity index or a bond fund? Hmm. Actually, those are two def different uh, assets. Yes. Um, so you'd, you would invest in a bond fund because you are um, re relatively conservative or moderate in terms of risk taking. And you would go into equities because you're looking for growth. Um, and, and therefore, the risk that you're exposing yourself uh, is higher than fixed income investments. Uh, this year, 2020, is a clear example. While fixed income is, uh, has resulted in positive performance, um, equities are down 24% year to date, 40% um, at one point in mid-March. And, and that just highlights the, uh, the difference in, in risk. And, and volatility. Um, so to try to answer that question, I'd say um, if you are a moderate uh, investor, you may want to invest in both uh, with more tilted towards fixed income investments as a start. Uh, investing in equity, uh, an equity index fund is definitely a good start to get yourself uh, um, uh, initiated in the world of equities or the stock market. Um, but I would uh, get into it slowly if you've never invested in equities. Um, and index uh, definitely could, could be uh, the product for you. It's good that you mentioned in terms of, you know, the pace or timing when it comes to entering, especially in the equity market. Because there was a follow-up question for that. Had you answered to go for an, an equity fund, equity index fund? Um, it's asking is if it's better to hold on to cash right now or should they start investing gradually today? Uh, as we've mentioned in our previous webinars, um, the test of a successful investor is having cash at the start of the crisis. Uh, but having less cash getting out of the crisis. And as we've been talking in this episode, it's gearing up for the recovery. Uh, we believe that we may have seen the worst in terms of the real economy uh, and hopefully even in the stock market performance uh, during the second quarter of this year when uh, the market was pricing in a recession and when the actual numbers came out for the second quarter, GDP and earnings, they were truly dismal. Mm -hmm. uh, but moving forward, there should be a relative improvement uh, in both the GDP numbers as well as the, uh, the earnings of our listed companies. Um, yeah, so do it gradually. Um, we don't know how, how much everybody has in cash. But the time to deploy probably would be this uh, this uh, October to November period. Uh, there would be a lot of volatility on account of the uh, upcoming U.S. elections. Number one, very important event. Yep. Um, and and number two, the continued rise of COVID cases globally and locally, uh, which could uh, restart talks about pulling back again or closing the economy. This could be triggers for for the markets to correct moving forward. Okay, so so basically, to some of what you just said, gradually put that cash into an you know yep. an investment outlet. Yep, definitely. Okay. 
Next question, Fritz, would be in terms of your recommended asset allocation for a millennial. Like, <laughs> so you're sorry. still a millennial? Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, uh, there, there, sorry, uh, let me let, just uh, finish the rest of the question because it, it, I, I think this client already has some sort of experience when it comes to creating a portfolio because he or she mentioned here, like, is it right to have 50% equities, 30% in rental properties, and 20% in bonds? You know, that, that's a very good allocation, Patty. Um, so um, the, the critical word here is the age. Uh, being a millennial, in general, the younger you are, the higher the allocation you can put in equities, uh, simply because you have the time uh for the market to recover mm -hmm. so putting 40 to 50 percent at that age is is appropriate uh not so if you are in the uh 65 to 75 range um so that's correct uh second would be uh, investing in properties or um those uh, have um, rental income yes that, those that could give you rental income is also a, a good play um for a millennial to talk about rental income is definitely surprising uh it would be the behavior usually of our parents uh but to to already invest in in, in property at that age uh, is, is a good move yeah. um simply because it is recurring income all the way until he or she uh, uh retires so that's always a good investment and number two you can also sell it later on if the price is really uh sort okay. yep once again post recovery um and, and then the balance is is cash patty what was it the third uh no 20 percent in bond so nothing okay. nothing left so nothing in cash so uh, then de definitely that's a good allocation uh that will prevent the millennial <laughs> the said millennial from uh consuming uh all of her, uh, his or her excess cash uh so making your cash or savings work for you uh will definitely allow you to reap the benefits once you age down the road so you can say the client who sent in this question is a wise millennial definitely, definitely. Smart, wise one. <laughs> um fritz i don't know but this this next question probably is um contradicts what or at least this misunderstood what what you said um during that episode wherein um it's making reference to what you said about holding on and not to do anything i think in terms mm -hmm. of um if you were already invested in the stock market if i remember it correctly for how long do you think should i hold and wait that's what the client is asking oh okay well the context when i said that was uh <laughs> if you are worried if you are uh, gripped with fear and anxiety then rather than uh, sell and take the loss, mm. be better off holding, right? That was the context. However, I said that if you can overcome your fear and, mm. and uh, slowly average down or buy at lower prices to bring your average cost down, mm. especially during this uh, pullback, uh, then that would be a better uh, solution. Uh, or a better course of action uh, because once you average down your total cost your average cost then uh, on the recovery once share prices begin to move up then it would give you a higher chance of moving to the black at the soonest possible time okay next question fritz um probably similar to the one earlier um about choosing between an equity index fund or a bond fund, but this time it's asking you in a pandemic or during this pandemic, which would you recommend as a form of diversification? You go for the stock market or you go for a bond investment? Well, uh, once you diversify your portfolio, it should be able to, to, to insulate you from the excesses, both on the upside and on the downside. And when you look at what has happened during the pandemic, uh, 
it has been uh, the equities, equity assets that have uh, headed south. And therefore, if you are deploying right now, I would direct you to really consider uh, the equity side by either looking at an equity index fund or, or other equity funds uh, that are available both in BDO and, and in the market. Um, simply because uh, it offers you, um, what I said, uh, a mega sale, an opportunity to buy uh, at uh, relatively cheap prices. Uh, on the bond side, uh, on bond funds, uh, I believe that most of the upside has been priced in uh, with the aggressive announcement and eventually uh, action from the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. First, sorry, uh, when you see upside, you're referring to the price, correct? To the price, yes. Um, so the uh, interest rates or the yields have gone down and therefore the prices have already moved up. When okay. you look at uh, where yields are today, as we've uh, uh, explained in our previous uh, webinar series, uh, we are already at historically low uh, interest rates for both for the whole yield curve from mm -hmm. the shortest uh, time deposit at uh, sub 1% all the way to your 10-year fixed rate treasury note currently uh, at sub 2.6%. Uh, these are already historical lows and therefore the prices of those bonds have already soared. So to buy at these levels now, where the prices are at these levels, um, and once yields move up on account of the higher borrowing uh, schedule moving forward, then I believe that uh, that may limit the upside of our investors. Uh, on the other hand, for equities that have gone down, if you buy at these levels, then once the recovery takes place, then there's a higher chance of making money for you thus your answer here is equities yes okay now talking about we've been talking about equities but this next question um is about ipo or initial public offerings um it's saying that there are several in the pipeline right now such as converge um a double dragon read and even a San Miguel preferred share offer, but not necessarily all considered IPOs, right? Um, would you say these are good entry points for a new investor or good in, good entry investments for a new investor? Uh, the the client is correct. There are three offerings in the pipeline. Um, so converge would be the equities that would. <laughs> Yes, yeah. uh, it would really be a, a, a secondary sale of secondary shares uh, in, in the market. Uh, so there are no details yet released to the public. Um, but yes, it would be a, a good place simply because uh, at this time, both workers and students are working from home or learning from home. And therefore, as we mentioned, data is, is in high demand. Yeah, you um, so I would assume that for Converge, it would be an issue of price uh, at, uh, and valuations. Um, but right now, there are no details yet. Uh, with respect to the other two, uh, there are no details. Yes, for the Double Dragon uh, read, uh, Ayala Land started it off, uh, Double Dragon mm -hmm. and a few more property uh developers could be looking at REITs. Um, uh, for REITs, what you'd have to look at would be, number one, the uh, the issuer. Uh, number two, the types of properties that would be put in the vehicle. Uh, number three, the, the dividend uh, yield that is uh, being offered to the public. Uh, definitely, it has to be higher than your uh, then your 10-year yield at 2.6 percent so when you look at other markets the dividend uh, yield would be at around four and a half to six percent uh, so it would be a different uh, way to analyze uh, a REIT rather than the the IPO of Converge 
And and finally, in terms of preferred, uh, again, a, a different animal. Uh, a preferred uh, wouldn't have any maturity, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the dividends would be subject to positive retained earnings, uh, which could be challenging in, in the short term be because of COVID-19. Um, and, and then uh, if you're comfortable with the issuer, uh, because most likely you'll be holding it for a longer period of time. So what's good, Patty, uh, uh, as mentioned by, by our client, is that there are still uh, uh, transactions in the pipeline that would be offered to investors. Um, but you have to uh, analyze them um, uh, clearly. Um, in order to to uh, to understand the risks that you are facing moving forward. Fritz, this question I think you'd like, <laughs> you will like. Um, we have a client who's a senior citizen, age 70 years old, who would, who's asking if it's still rational for him or her to invest in the stock, in stocks. Well, um definitely you can still invest in stocks but given your age um which is already the above above the average age of the filipino at 68 um i'd say you go slowly um and uh put your account under uh an, an end or an or <laughs> um maybe your daughter or son uh, so that if anything happens, um, they can continue um, to in, to to look after the look after. Yes. Uh, just go slowly. <laughs> you cannot be as aggressive as the millennial earlier, uh, <laughs> asking for fifty percent. At that age, it it should be much much lower. I'd say lower than twenty percent. Okay, Fritz from Equities. Can we go to? Um, questions on the foreign exchange. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, there are a lot of questions asking um, about your forecast for the dollar peso exchange rate. But before we go there, can you try to answer first or tell our clients why the peso has been strong this year? What's what's driving it? Okay, that's an excellent question. When you look at previous crises, both uh, political and uh, financial crises uh, during the last uh, three or four decades, the Philippine peso has always been on a depreciating trend, um, moving in line with the Thai baht and the Indonesian rupiah. Uh, this year, however, we're seeing uh, all of those currencies uh, weaken by two and a half to as much as uh, six percent. Uh, while the peso is the best performing currency up more than 4% year to date. The main reason for that behavior, uh, people say, is because the dollar is weak. But if so, then uh, how come the other currencies are weak but the peso is strong? And therefore, our, our answer to the question why is because uh, imports have collapsed. Uh, imports uh, have usually been higher than exports in the Philippines, which has resulted in a trade deficit. That trade deficit has uh, weakened the peso. This year, however, the, the imports from both the government and the private sector have practically collapsed, and uh, you have a narrower trade deficit and consequently a current account surplus and a balance of payment surplus meaning there is more inflows or supply of us dollars um in the, in the, in the philippines and that's why your gross international reserves are at an all-time high approaching 100 billion us dollars now um it is good for us yeah and that's good for us right um and, and that's the reason why your peso is, is strong today. So if you look at it, as you open the economy now, as companies get back to work, they will import again. They will import capital equipment, intermediate goods, and raw materials that are needed for the economy to continue to operate. 
Uh, and when that happens, uh, you'll see the peso uh, weaken uh, probably by, by uh, the second half of 2021. So what's your fearless forecast for the end of the year, Fritz? Okay, so our, our forecast uh, by year end is for the peso to head towards 48 pesos per US dollar. Um, that was a stark change to our initial forecast of 52 entering the year. Um, and, and it's because of that imports have collapsed. And, and moving forward to next year, we're calling for uh, 49.60. Uh, um, if we are successful in opening up the economy again and imports recover. Um, but un until we see that happening, uh, the peso will remain relatively strong uh, compared to our peers in the region. Fritz, we have a client here, possibly an OFW, asking what should their investment strategy be, especially that they're earning in U.S. dollars and they'd like to invest in the Philippines? That, that's a good question. So, you know, dollar earners are in a unique uh, situation simply because they already have the foreign exchange, the foreign currency, the U.S. dollar. Um, so they convert to peso what they'll need to spend. Uh, maybe by a conservative investment. But with the dollar, they can already invest in, let's say, for equities, they can already invest in our uh, global equity index fund uh, if they want equities. Or they can invest in our dollar money market fund uh, for very conservative investors. Or they may even look at a dollar bond fund so there are already existing investments in U.S. dollar um, so that they don't have to convert it at a low rate, you know. Um, so ride the, the, the strength right now, invest in the dollar. Um, and then once the peso begins to depreciate and their underlying investment has already made money, then maybe at that point they can consider converting uh, to the peso and then looking for peso investments. So basically, you're saying stick to dollar investments for dollar earners and look for dollar denominated instruments, the ones that, such as the ones that you just mentioned. Yes. And talking about dollar investments, and you mentioned the feeders, correct? Yes. Let me give you this as the final question for today. Okay, I'll let you take that sip of water first. Go ahead, Patty. What would you recommend in terms of these two uh, BDO feeder funds? Would it be the emerging market or the China equity feeder fund? Oh, that means uh, that uh, client has been uh, uh, um, following or monitoring yeah. global funds as well as uh, global uh, trends. So the China fund... Um, has done very well this year, simply because China was the first to get COVID in November in Wuhan, and was also the first to get out of the pandemic, opening up the economy again. And, and therefore, when you look at uh, global GDP, uh, China is one of the few countries that is not experiencing a recession. That's number one. And number two, uh, when you look at the earnings of Chinese companies, they have not been hurt as badly as those in the developed markets or even here in Asia, simply because it was only Wuhan uh, that closed down. The epicenter, yeah. Their economy, the epicenter. Uh, Beijing was still open, Shanghai was still open, uh, and, and, and the other uh, uh, industrial centers. So China is doing very well. And, and with our China fund, when you look at it, close to 50% of the total fund is invested in the new economy. The likes of Alibaba and Tencent uh, and Ping An and uh, China Construction. Uh, these are the companies that are in the new, new age, the new era. Um, so it would be really uh, good for our clients to, to look at China seriously, our China fund seriously. Now, when you look at the emerging market fund, 
this would be a, another recovery play. So the emerging market fund does not include only China. It includes Brazil, uh, Russia, um, and, and other emerging markets, which were clearly badly hit by, by, by COVID-19. But again, as they gear up for the recovery and, and the U.S. market becomes uh, increasingly uh, stretched in terms of valuation, when you look at 2021 strategies, there are more and more houses calling about calling for a shift to emerging market funds. Uh, so I'd say that in the near term, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's a call on China, okay. uh, despite the run up. But if you want to be ahead of the market and again, buy on the mega sale, um, I, I push our clients to, to put a little start to put a little to gradually accumulate the emerging market fund. Fritz, thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, we'd let you go back to, you know, overlooking to the more than a trillion pesos of assets that, that you know, you're in charge of. And um, we'd like to thank our clients as well for sending in these questions. Um, and we hope we're able to answer as many of them as we can today. Definitely, Patty. We, we, we thank all our clients, not only for tuning in and, and watching all our uh, webinar series, but also for engaging and asking questions. And we just wish to apologize that we couldn't answer everything during the previous uh, series. Uh, but hopefully, uh, this would make up more than make up uh, and uh, we tried our best to answer as many questions as we could. So stay safe, Patty, and for our clients, uh, stay safe and keep in touch. In behalf of BDO, Unibank Inc. and its subsidiaries, we wish for you and your families good health and safety. I'm Patty Santiago, and we look forward to having you in the next edition of Market Sense.